Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And uh, hopefully you were able to uh, watch all of uh, our screener of All In, The Fight for Democracy, the new Amazon original documentary that's coming out in theaters today um, and will also be available on Prime, Amazon Prime Video on September 18th. Um, this event tonight is part of an initiative that we're starting that we're going to have throughout the fall called uh, SCA Votes 2020. And um, we'll announce several other events as the semester goes along. But uh, tonight, um, we're, we're very lucky to have the director producers of All In, Liz Garbus and Lisa Cortez. And they'll be in conversation with SCA professor Brenda Goodman, a distinguished fellow at the USC Center for Excellence in Teaching. Um, before we jump into the q and A, I I did want to also mention that the way that we take audience questions is that we ask everyone to write their questions in the Q&A box in Zoom. Um, and then when we open it up to audience questions, we'll call on people specifically and invite them over to become panelists temporarily so that they can turn on their video and ask their questions live. Uh, for anyone out there, um, if you're not camera ready, you don't have to turn on your video. Uh, just make sure that you can turn on your mic. Um, and um, that usually adds at least a little bit of um, uh, extra intimacy to these Q&As. Uh, so I will call people uh, um, one, one by one once we get to that point. And in the meantime, uh, I leave it over to you, Brenda. Okay, well, thanks, Alex. And thank you both Liz and Lisa for being here uh, at SEA. And I love that graphic that's there about how many days to the election. Um, and thank you for making such a wonderful film. Uh, I'm wondering if both of you wouldn't mind just giving a brief introduction of yourselves because you both have had such incredible careers. And uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about what you did before and then we'll get into the film that you made together. So Liz, if you would go first. Uh, just talking about sure. some of the films that you've made and, and also maybe your a little bit of your family history. Sure. Well, Brenda, I can probably speaking for both Linda uh, for Lisa and myself, we are going to be very excited to take um, viewer, viewers questions and see their faces. We've been doing so many of these um, things that we feel like we're alone in these boxes and it's um, such a strange way to release a film. So we're really excited about this format. Um, it'll be refreshing for us to actually talk to folks who have seen the film. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I have been so for a long time. Um, I started my career making films actually in, in prisons. Um, the first narrative, uh, the first feature length documentary I directed was called The Farm in Gola, USA, which was about um, the, the slave plantation turned prison in Louisiana. Um, and since then I've made films um, on journalism recently, like The Fourth Estate, um, amazing musicians um, and icons like Nina Simone and um, other stuff that I hope you'll check out um, and leading to today with this collaboration with Lisa. And well, you can, yes, please, Lisa. Oh, did you want Liz to talk about her family background? Oh, or, or and I also just hands the mic to me. We're going to get punchy with you, Brenda. It's we're in on the East Coast here in New York, and um, bring it on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll I'll toggle and then I'll pass the mic back to Liz because there's actually a really interesting um, connection that we have as filmmakers. Um, my background: I started as a producer, and one of the very first films that I worked on as an assistant was Monster's Ball, which was shot at Angola. Um, <laughs> it's so interesting to have come from that narrative background to then have uh, continued at producing for uh, uh, in, uh, to documentaries, most notably the Apollo Theater doc that was released last year. Um, and then this, uh, in 2019, I uh, started directing more and have a film called The Remix, Hip Hop Times Fashion. 
Um, so, you know, I think the connection about social justice issues, but also looking at interesting cultural icons in our work is something that, um, you know, Liz and I are both curious about. So Liz, tell me about your family background. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk about your family background. You could talk about mine. I um, will. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lisa and I both, I mean, I think that as folks saw who watched this movie, um, we do inherit a lot from our parents and ancestors. You saw the values that Stacy's parents instilled in her, um, dragging her to the voting booth and um, protesting injustices, personal and culture and in their community. Um, uh, I think that, you know, when some I've been asked, you know, as as a as a white person, you know, how aware was I of voter suppression? Um, and, um, and I think that part of white privilege means you don't have to encounter um, obstacles to casting your ballot um, in many cases. Um, for me, I, I did know that this was a privilege afforded to, to me based upon my skin color pretty early on. Um, my father was a lawyer in the 60s for the ACLU. And one of the cases he, he liked to talk about, which he told us about a bunch, was the case of a woman in Mississippi named Henrietta Wright who was uh, beaten and jailed after registering to vote. 20 days after the Voting Rights Act, she went to register to vote and she was um, arrested, beaten in the jail and then sent to a mental institution. So early on, I knew that, um, that this was not uh, something that was uh, a right given afforded to all Americans. So that's a little bit about my background as it relates to this film. And, um... You know, the, the, my story intersects with, with Liz is again, uh, in terms of, you know, not being shielded from this reality um, from a very early age. Uh, I think through the work of my parents, uh, but also through my grandparents and um, ancestors that I actually have recently disco I've discovered in Latin America also, who have been continuously advocating for the protection of black bodies for the exercise of all of our rights uh, and um, to be able to interrogate history and have this conversation that is really true I we feel is nonpartisan because you know on both sides you can see who has been aggressors in this space but to use it, our platform to kind of honor the work of people in our family, but also to extend and engage broader communities as we move into uh, this election cycle. Um, well, let me, let me just say that both of you are very modest. I probably should have done your intros because you, uh, you left a lot of key highlights out, including the board <laughs> nominations and other films that you've made, but I am hungry to sort of get into the work that you did together. So I do hope people will take time and look at their filmographies and, and see what uh, our accomplished guests have done. Let me ask you, how did you come to work together? And, and what is it like co-directing and co-producing? Lisa, do you wanna, you wanna? I mean, you, you want to do the origin story or? Uh, oh, okay. Um, well, I well, could do the origin I, story. Okay, we, you we do it. Talk. You do it. We'll mix it up. Mix it up. You do it. Okay. Well, we, we came together because of Stacey Abrams. Uh, around a year ago, she met with uh, several documentary filmmakers uh, because she wanted to tell the story, the history of voting rights and voter suppression. And uh, she met with Story Syndicate, which is a company that Liz founded with her husband, Dan. And um, in turn, uh, she decided to work with Story Syndicate. I had been a fan and friend of uh, Liz and Dan, and I had worked with Dan on the Apollo Theater documentary. He was an executive producer. And so that's kind of the, the genesis 
of uh, how our journey started. Okay, and what, what was the, you know, because it's an unusual situation where you're both co-producing and you're co-directing. Um, what's that relationship like? How did you work together? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. I think in documentaries, the boundaries between producing and directing are a little bit blurry. It's a little, it's different than in scripted films. Lisa and I have worked, both of us have worked in both genres, uh, formats, and, um, and, you know, because part of producing is, you know, talking to your interview subjects and getting them to decide to be in your film. And then you develop relationships with them and then you interview them and then they like you and then they share some great footage with you. And, you know, all of those things are really both producing and directing, right? Because it's building trust. And Lisa and I both did those things. We had a lot of work to do on this film. Um, we had a lot of ground to cover. And so we, you know, we, we sort of divided and conquered and we both interviewed and we had um, different edit rooms and we were both able to kind of work with, you know, on separate sections and then bring them back together. And it was truly a collaboration. And, um, you know, obviously Lisa and I have different lived experiences and is really important to have conversations which involved those different takes and different assumptions we might bring to the table in filmmaking. So it was a super healthy and robust um, team that we formed, I think. You know, I think Brenda, uh, you know, um, I wanna share a story with you uh, and particularly for the folks tonight who saw our film. You know, there's several times where the N word appears. Once uh, on the body of, of someone who's, uh, the, the effigy is hanging and lynching and in a cartoon. And Liz was like, okay, we can redact, we can do something. And I was like, no, we're going to keep it as is. It, I, we can't make our, this history palatable. I think until all of us come to terms with the complexity and the contradictions that we live in as Americans that we're not going to make progress. So that I think is an interesting example of interrogating the, the story and then having a really healthy exchange about a very painful word and obviously connected to really painful images. Are you that, it's interesting that you talk about the fact that until we come to grips with where we are, we can't move forward. Does that make you optimistic about what's happening right now in terms of people on the streets, the conversation that's being had, the Black Lives Matter movement? Well, that we're talking with you, Brenda, and we have 65 people who are sending in, I see some incredible questions. You know, this used to be uh, spinach, you know, to civics, you know, was, was not a sexy thing to get engaged with. And the mobilization that is happening, the conversations that are intergenerational um, are, are, hope, are, are heartening. Um, we have to be hopeful uh, because we know what the opposite of that energy is. And, I'll, and just to add to that, the silver lining of all of this trash and disinformation being put out about our election and even the abuse of the Postal Service, I mean, it's, there, you know, there's not a silver lining, but the, the, the uh, one effect of it is that we're talking about it and people are getting informed about, and this is also because of the pandemic, about different ways that they can vote and being, becoming aware if they have early voting opportunities, becoming aware about ballot drop boxes. Like there's a lot of awareness to, that is coming out of this garbage um, that I think is productive. So if there's, I think that voter turnout, voter suppression is obviously gonna be a major battle. Um, claims of fraud, you know, we're all bracing for it. But the good news is we're talking about it. Uh, we won't be caught off guard and um, folks are getting educated and the tools are out there. You know, you've got everybody from Stacey Abrams to LeBron James, you know, putting out that information about how to check your registration. Don't assume just because you registered last election, you're still on the rolls. Where is that ballot drop box? How can you volunteer to be a poll worker if you feel, uh, 
young and healthy and, you know, you want to go do that. So I think that these conversations are the silver lining. And, you know, and Liz, as you're saying this, I'm thinking, you know, if anything, the conversations are stealing us on how we learn, lean into information and pre create an armor around the chaos and the fear, because we're seeing it for the, the tactic of this, you know, that it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody right now is looking for something to hang on to that, that, that they can take as something positive because we are certainly in a time where there's a lot coming at us from every angle that is a little disheartening. Uh, when we got on this call tonight, we were talking about fires in California and we can't separate that from climate change and we can't separate that from what's happening in in the government at the moment. So there's a lot that you can be discouraged about. Um, but I, I love that you're feeling like that there is possibility and hope here if we can engage and talk about what's happening with voter suppression. Um, so, um, but it, I wanna go back to what we were talking about just a minute ago. So it seems like Stacy was the one that got this film going and got you two connected. That's what I was hearing. This was, was her, the, the genesis of this was her idea. How yeah, the genesis was her family? idea, but um, yes, the genesis was her idea, but um, we, um, you know, Lisa and I connected separate from that. But, but, and one thing that I think will be, you know, worthwhile talking about, be interesting to the audience is when, you know, when Stacy first came to us, she said, you know, I don't want this to be the Stacey Abrams show. She had been approached by filmmakers probably, you know, more than a dozen times about making the follow film about Stacey and, you know, and what she really felt strongly about was that once you reduce it to a single race or a single candidate who you might like, you might not like a state who you think, oh, that state is messed up, my state's not like that. You know, once you reduce it to that single story, you're losing sight, you're, 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 you're losing sight of, the, of the, the big story, which is what happened in Georgia is a feature, not a bug, right? And it is, we can't understand Georgia until we understand hundreds of years of its history that have created, created that, that condition. Um, so I think that that, you know, while Lisa and I continue <laughs> over the course of months to push back and say, we need a little Stacy here, we need a little, just trust us, you know, it's not going to be the Stacy show, we're going to get that. But at the same time, she was right, you know, because it's, um, it shouldn't be about, you know, as Stacy says, she doesn't have the right to win an election, but the voters have the right to have their, vo their votes counted. Um, and that is really what this is all about. Um, Lisa, can you tell me the, how you, what All In represents? What's the title mean? Well, I, I think it just speaks to a couple of things, Brenda. Uh, on the, the broad strokes, it is about engagement. Um, and for us to have a healthy democracy, everyone who is eligible to vote should be allowed to vote. Um, I also think it, it speaks to the Constitution, you know, and which said, we the people, which we thought was encompassing everyone. And unfortunately, it took the 15th, the 19th amendments, and then the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and then with subsequent, you know, amendments in 1975 to really extend the franchise to so that everyone could be all in. So I know that sounds a little trite, but it, it just to, you know, this fight for democracy is something that encompasses all of us. I would certainly agree with that. It's interesting though, it, I was I was very much struck by the footage of LBJ talking about the Voting Rights Amendment and then watching both sides of the aisle give him a standing ovation. That just floored me when I saw that uh, footage. And all the archival footage you guys got was really incredible. Um, and here we are today where that would never happen in Congress. 
And, uh, you know, just that journey of how we got there, um, I'm wondering how you feel about that. And also when you talk about the elections, how concerned are you that this might go to the Supreme Court? Well, I just want to go back to the LBJ comment for a moment. You know, I think what was fantastic for Liz and I is that we had the opportunity to spend time with, with Andrew Young. You know, we've had tremendous loss this year with C.T. Vivian, with John Lewis, and um, Ambassador Young is one of the last lions left. And, and he really contributes to the emotion uh, that we always wanted our film to visit throughout the course of the storytelling. Um, I, I love him talking about the, the whole thing about the power, you know, and, and like, we're going to find a way to, to give uh, LBJ uh, the power. And then I think also having um, Lucy Baines Johnson yes. um, was a great compliment to the story because as a, as a direct witness um, to history. Uh, your second question was about could this election go to the Supreme Court? Well, I, I hope that it doesn't, but I think that we all should be prepared that we might, you know, we're used to having an instant, instant results the night of. And we might be in a situation where it will take some time to have uh, the concrete answers about who the official winner is. Yeah, I mean, one of the things Stacy says is, you know, thinking about not election day, but election season, you know, and that means early voting, you know, mailing in ballots, and then also the fact that if it's taken a little while to figure out what the results are, that means the system is working, um, you know, that, that ballots are being counted, and it's really incumbent upon journalists to set the expectation so, you know, everything doesn't boil, the pot doesn't boil over with stress. It's got to be at a simmer for a little while as the votes are counted. That means people are doing their jobs. One of the things that you talked about when we initially connected on this Zoom was about you understanding your privilege as a white woman in terms of voting hasn't been a his an issue for you in this country. I'm, I'm sometimes struck by uh, a lot of people um, who feel like there isn't a choice to be made and therefore they're indifferent to voting when so many people have gone to jail, been beaten, died, been denied the vote, had the vote taken away. What's your response to that? Well, you know, as one of our heroes says in our film, if your vote didn't matter, they wouldn't be working so hard to take it away from you. And let's just also talk about what's on the ballot in November. It's not just about who becomes president. That's, that's important. But you're also voting for, you know, the judge who may decide what kind of sentence um, your cousin gets and the mayor who is in charge of hiring the police and, you know, the school board who, you know, is going to be in there deciding how your kids are going to be kept safe um, during a pandemic. So, you know, if people think that, it, that, you know, whoever's president, you know, my life isn't going to change. Okay, there may be some truth to that, right? It's not going to change overnight if it's Biden or Trump, you know, there's a lot of work to do, but on those, on those down ballot races, it, it does have a huge impact in your life. Um, so I think it's also important to broaden the conversation when we talk about, and what about the Supreme Court? You know, we're talking about, you know, if it's another four years of Republicans, we probably end up with a 7-2 court. Um, and, um, you know, so, so, so there is a lot at stake um, from the top to the down to the, the bottom, which is not the bottom, but the lowest part of that, that ballot that you're filling out. Lisa, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, uh, no, I think you, I think Brenda, your, uh, Liz is uh, addressed all. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's the East Coast delay, folks. <laughs> Um, just a couple of more questions and then we'll throw it over to the Q&A, um, the audience who I know you're eager to connect with. Um, I was very struck by, Car is it Carol Anderson? You're, mm -hmm. How did you come to find her and what was the process by which you, how you decided who your voting experts would be? A lot of the people that we chose to interview um, had relationships with Stacy, 
and um, you know, Stacy as a producer on the project definitely opened up and shared those uh, connections. Um, but you know, uh, Professor um, Anderson, who is at Emory, you know, has also written a tremendous book, uh, One Person No Vote, uh, which uh, we looked at for uh, you know as we mined the architecture and and told this history. One of the things that was so great about her was, you know, taking it to the personal level, um, which was something Lisa and I wanted to do throughout the film. So, you know, you can talk about clan violence and you can talk about um, white terror, but then you kind of tell the story of Maceo Snipes and it breaks it all down. And Carol's book, you know, One Person No Vote is, is full of stories like that. And for people wanting to know more, um, highly recommend it. That leads me to my last question. Was there something in your research or something in the filmmaking that was a surprise to you? Both of you, what surprised you the most? Well, it was very surprising to have to finish the film during the pandemic. <laughs> but everybody's gone through that particular surprise as our lives have been turned upside down. But. Um, I, look, I think that, um, you know, the, the, Kate, the Amendment 4 in Florida, you know, that was all happening in real time as we were making the film, and there have been so many ups and downs in that um, case. Um, uh, but, um, you know, the thing about voter suppression and about our history is that there is, there, there is a bit of a playbook um, of how this all happens, and it may not be billy clubs or police hoses right now. It might be ID laws but they have the same effect. So um, I wish I was surprised more, in fact, by the history because there is that, that playbook. Yeah, I think I, you know, I, I hear the words of my mother, like, you know, a dirty dog is a dirty dog. Um, and so over the course of, uh, you know, looking at 400 years of, of history, particularly for African-Americans, you know, there is a consistent narrative in terms of movement from being seen as three-fifths of a human to becoming fully humanized and then demonized. Um, and so that is a narrative that, you know, I hope that we are moving away from. Here, here. I hope so too. Um, Alex, should we open it up to... Uh... Yeah, definitely. Um, let's first go out to Jill Franco. Um, Jill, I'm going to move you over to the panelist side. And Jill, when you're ready, you are welcome to turn on your video and audio or just your audio. Well, this normally goes a little bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom life. Don't get too excited about seeing an audience now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we're really about to be disappointed. We're really looking forward to this. Okay, while Jill's figuring that out, uh, let me welcome over Bin Zhang. Hello. Hi, Hello. Lisa, Lisa, great film, enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. So, Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, that's history and, and the current situation. Um, yeah, I, I, I knew Stacey Abram lost, but, but I didn't know she lost that way. It's, uh, it's depressing. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I, I guess it's what can citizens do to, uh, to stop uh, voter suppression, right? Uh, I mean, we, we seems we are powerless. What, what can we do about it? Uh, <laughs> You're not powerless. Um, you know, I mean, I as Stacey Abrams says, the best antidote to voter suppression is voter turnout. Um, and so, you know, if you know you're registered and you know you have a plan to vote, 
It's about calling five people. Don't, you know, make sure they don't assume that their registration is still active, that they check, they check that their polling places it hasn't moved. We can defeat this. We have been through trials like this before. Um, you know, think of the, the folks who had to, you know, walk across that bridge, uh, the Edmund Pettit Bridge and, you know, take blows to their bodies. So we have been here before, we can, we can do this. Um, it's about information and it is, it is the people, the courts will not save us, politicians will not save us. So it really is about people showing up. You may have to stand online far too long. If they try to turn you away at the polls, you request a provisional ballot. We have tools, we just have to get the information out and use them. There you are, audience member. Hello. Okay, the craziest thing happened. The movie started running in my application, and both noises were in my ears, you all and the movie. So I guess it was a sign I need to see the movie again. <laughs> sorry about that. Technology. Hi, Jill. Um, uh, sorry, Jill, before you, Ben, were, uh, did you have any follow up? Yeah, so, so I, yeah, I kind of I, have, I, I, if I can finish. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have a couple, a couple questions, right? So can, can, uh, how, how are we going to make the Congress say making the election day a national holiday, right? Because it's very hard for people to make a living, especially if you're not making much, and and, and you you take a lot of time, especially in the so uh, photo suppressed area that you 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 have don't have uh, enough uh, uh, space, I mean, place to vote. So so what what it does it take for the Congress to make it a national holiday? So make citizen voting a little easier, right? Um, yeah. Well, can we, can, can we do something about that? Well, we should, but you should also know that I think it's 41 states have early voting. Um, so that does mean you, you have in, met, in most states, you have a choice of what day you have to show up at the polls. Um, and of course you can do mail-in balloting and absentee ballots in almost every state with no excuse. There, you know, the problem with America is we have 50 different election systems. Every state has its own system. So we've actually created a website called allinforvoting.com where you can become aware of your options in your state because there's not one single answer. But in terms of election day becoming a national holiday, I'm with you. Um, it's gonna require progressives being elected. Um, you know, and I know a lot of people are also talking about the electoral college being anti-democratic um, as you know, this last election um, was won by a person who made, got less, fewer votes. Um, so I think that it's about it's about getting out to vote to get the kind of representatives who agree with you. The best antidote is voter turnout and exercising. And I think then, you know, it's, it's making a plan with people in your community to uh, go with you if you are going to go. And, but, and I think what we are hearing a lot now is try to vote as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jill, you're up. <laughs> Sorry about that. What a mess. Um, anyway, thank you again for that terrific film. Um, my question, you touched on it a little bit in the film. Um, I've, be, I've been working on voter protection issues and calling voters, especially in North Carolina, um, Pennsylvania, and I'm particularly interested in the issue that certain states still um, have very strict laws against people who are formerly incarcerated, often referred to as felons, who um, cannot vote. Uh, in your research to make the film, have you come across organizations that are working towards changing these laws. I know it's state by state and the Supreme Court decision doesn't, um, but I'm curious if you talk a little bit about that. You froze a little bit, Jill. Um, and oh, okay. So I, I think we got, yeah. Your you question got this. was about um, organizations that are, are working with returning citizens and helping them to, to 
So obviously we, we um, spent uh, time with Desmond Mead of FRRC. Um, I think that their, uh, their website is a great resource, you know, the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, um, to kind of be current on what's happening in Florida, but also in the conversation with other returning citizens um, and, the, and the vote uh, in this season. Okay. And my other question is about you're, cut, you're cutting out again. Using the film. Okay. If 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 we um, are interested in using the film for groups that are working on voter protection, how can we go about doing that? You can. <laughs> you go, Liz. <laughs> okay, allinforvoting.com. There's actually a menu with a drop down bar, which is host to screening in your community. So it's all set up because this is very, you know, we really would love for the film to be used as a tool. Um, so it's right there for you on our website. And Thank Jill, you. On Thank the you. website, we have a fantastic um, social media toolkit, which has um, really concise. Uh, social media, uh, gifts, et cetera, that you can download and that really help with giving concrete information to your community. And so all of these resources are found on allinforvoting.com. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I, I want to move over Salome Mazart, who has a related question, um, but maybe instead of um, uh, there, there might be a way to discuss some of the ways that this can be incorporated into uh, high school curriculum. Let me uh, just move Salome over. Lisa, you, you can address that if you, yeah, okay. Oh, you're on mute, Salome. Hi, I was not expecting to be on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel that this is something that should be seen for especially uh, seniors or even, even high school in general, but um, those soon to be 18 year olds that we're about to enter into. Um, th there's got to be a way that this can be sent either, I don't know, for the schools to be, uh, I don't know, if, see, high school seniors are taking all sorts of courses and of course they're worried about going to college, you know, and all that, but especially during the times of voting, this needs to be seen because people don't, uh, they don't all, they don't, I'm gonna tell you, they don't. I have a 21 year old, she knows because she's a pre-law major, but other than that, uh, friends that we talk to, they don't know the history, they don't understand as well. They do understand to a certain degree, but they don't know it. And I feel that this needs to be shown to high school, for high schoolers, especially seniors, juniors and seniors somehow. And going forward, I feel there's gotta be a way to implement this even lower middle school, just because the time of awareness of what's going on in the world and how things happen is around that time. So uh, is, uh, do you have any idea, have you thought about this or? <laughs> I, I'm so happy um, that you asked this, Salome. I, I feel like you're a plant because this is information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been we've been dying to share. Um, yeah, um, when we started this film, we concurrently started and and created a social impact campaign, and of course the website, which we've uh, hawked several times. But um, there we are. We're not selling anything, by the way. We're not. You know, <laughs> it's just information. No <laughs> t-shirts or anything there. Uh, but I always feel like all in for voting .com. But all <laughs> being said, Salome, is that there is a educational curriculum that we right. have developed, uh, and it will be available shortly. Um, and the film has been broken down into pods, so it can okay. be presented in a classroom setting. Um, you know, all of that information can be found on allinforvoting.com. I'm already in. I was like, I'm posting on my Facebook page. I'm gonna oh. post on Instagram. <laughs> and I agree with you, Salome, that we don't need to wait when they're 18. I mean, I have a 13 year old and he absorbed all of it, you know? I mean, it's yeah. like, it doesn't have to, we don't have to wait that long. 
you know? Right. And so right. I agree with you that it could start at earlier grades too. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I love that you're all in. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? No, I said to Brenda, who had asked before about our title, I was like, do you see what it is, what being all in, being engaged, where, what we can do, and to have, start having these conversations that are right. not just among our friends, but they're with the younger people in our lives who we care about. But yes, and what we're also doing on the site is there's a lot of um, special kind of um, brief, like unpacking of history video mm -hmm. that were, will be there and the site is evergreen. So um, it will continue to morph and contribute factual information for people. Great, 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 great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question <laughs> and for watching. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to welcome over Danielle. And it'll just take a moment. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Hi, my name is Danielle. Um, I was curious as to the inclusion of the Heritage Foundation in the film. Mm. Um, I know it's not an organization that agrees with the message of the film. Um, I'm sure they weren't thrilled about Stacey Abrams. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the process of working with them um, and why they wanted to be part of the film. Well, we asked them to participate. And um, we asked a lot of others among them, you know, Brian Kemp, Chris Kobach, who did not, uh, who uh, participated. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, it, we wanted to have, we want there to be a healthy, robust conversation. And this is not a partisan film. We are looking at a history and we're looking at all the players and, and perspectives um, that were specific, particularly as we looked at Shelby County v. Holder, and that unique story. And to, you know, we were transparent that Stacey Abrams was the producer of the film. And, you know, to, to Hans's credit, he agreed to be interviewed. And he, um, you know, while uh, certainly, um, you know, we, we both believe that voter fraud is a, uh, is a, uh, what is the word, is, a, is an excuse, is, is it is a is a it is a it is a <laughs> it is an excuse for voter ID laws and other laws that are the cause of the voter suppression. We appreciate that Hans actually accepted our offer, knowing exactly who our team was. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to bring uh, Ben back over. He may be asking questions that we don't know the state's laws about. Oh, like sorry, I'm asking too many questions. No, so, no, no, we so, love the questions. We just yeah. want to be able to answer them. Right, so, <laughs> so um, like Michigan uh, 2018 has a proposal too, to have these uh, independent commission uh, for draw the district, uh, regional district, right? So how, how, how are we going to, uh, you know, make, make like such a similar proposal in every state ballot so we can have fair election. It's not controlled by, by a group of people that have their party's interest uh, first, right? Rather than the people's interest first. What does it take? Yeah. Do we, yeah. Well, I don't know what it takes in Michigan. I have to be honest with you. And every state is different. <laughs> I mean, I think that gerrymandering is a form of voter suppression and for, Folks, I mean, you know, our film did not focus on gerrymandering. There have been other really great films that have. I would recommend Slay the Dragon, which came out earlier this year. Um, and, um, but I think that um, this is a huge front in the battle because um, gerrymandering is a way for uh, politicians to divide the powers of community 
in such a way that they do not need to be responsive to the needs of people in community. And this is how you end up getting places like Flint where there's no clean water. I mean, this is, this is, you know, allows politicians to only cater to those who they feel like catering to. Um, but I, unfortunately, I do not have the specifics of a ballot proposal, um, what it takes in, in Michigan. I imagine it takes doing what Desmond Mead did, which is, you know, going door to door with a petition and getting a certain number of signatures to get on the ballot. But that would have to be fact yeah. checked. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, okay, it looks like we have one last um, comment, which is from Hermione Beard, and I'll move you over now. Okay, uh, so Hermione, you're on our, our side of things if you wanna turn on your, uh, your camera and your audio. If you're having difficulties, actually, we did get one more question uh, from Johnny Joseph, so I can try moving him over in the meantime. Any luck, Hermione? I see that your mic, oh, your mic was uh, unmuted for a second there. Um, is it unmuted now? I really hadn't planned on speaking. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I wanted to thank you for the history lesson. I hadn't heard of Maceo Snipes and his horrible story. That should be told so we can know more about these things. We hear about the horrors, but to actually see these things that we've never heard about, it's, we thank you for that. Well, thank you for your comment and for watching and hopefully spreading the word. <laughs> I will. It was an excellent movie. Very well done. Thank you for the experience. Thank you, Hermione. Thank you, Hermione. Okay, Johnny, we'll, we'll give you the last question. Oh, uh, oh, I see. <laughs> okay, why don't I just read your question? Uh, any plans for a new voter, uh, voter uh, Voting Rights Act? Oh, yes. The um, Voting Rights Act has been on Mitch McConnell's desk. I mean, as you know, because you saw the movie, the uh, Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act and threw it back because um, it, it, it declared certain sections of it um, outdated. And a new Voting Rights Act has been on Mitch McConnell's desk for 200 and some days um, that he has not brought to the floor. So, um, you know, this is why bringing, you know, this election is, is much more about, is much more than just about the president. It's about what kind of democracy we have moving forward. And so that's called the, uh, the Voting Rights Advancement Act. And another reason that we need to get everybody to the polls, exactly what you were talking about. There are, obviously there are races at the top of the ticket, presidential race, but there are, uh, races for Senate, Mitch McConnell being one of them. So there's a lot of things that will be decided. I think what, what we can all hope for when we're concerned about voter suppression is if we can come out in great numbers, then our voices cannot be diminished. I mean, that is the key. We have to overwhelm the system just like it happened in 2008. So your film is so critically an important part of that, of getting everybody to come out and vote. And before we say goodbye to you and I turn it back over to Alex, I do wanna to say to the SEA community that as Alex said, we have launched this initiative, SEA Votes. We're gonna be doing a number of things. And one of them is next week, we're launching a film contest for all of the film students for you to make a, a two minute or less film about what voting means to you. You don't have to be an American citizen. I think everyone's perspective on what it means to participate in the voting process or be denied that right, depending on where you are. All those uh, perspectives are welcome and look out for announcements about it. And it's part of an ongoing series. 
Uh, we're going to culminate in a big event on October 19th. And National Voter Registration Day is September 22nd. So exactly as our two wonderful guests said, go to their website, allin.com. Find no, out. No, allinforvoting.com. Allinforvoting.com. <laughs> um, and find out if you're registered, make sure you are, and make sure your vote is is counted. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Alex, but I want to thank you. The film was very inspiring and wonderful and important. And, uh, and I thank you both. Thank you, Brenda. Just before uh, I thank you as well, I, I did want to ask because we're, you know, uh, Brenda spearheaded voter registration drives with our students. Uh, in years past, and uh, often that involves some combination of free food and people <laughs> physically helping to, to fill in registration uh, cards. I'm curious, um, as you've been promoting the film, working on it, um, what, what have you found is effective in terms of uh, getting the 18-year-olds to care? Because, you know, even just looking at the attendees uh, and the people that have come on to speak, it's really... Uh, an issue that engages older audiences more than it does, you know, uh, the, the students who are, are now sort of back in session. And so we're trying in a variety of ways to um, get people motivated who are 18 and, and, and in a, um, student housing, but we can't necessarily, I mean, except for maybe some, some uh, Postmates deliveries, give them the, uh, the free food experience. So uh, what, what would you recommend? What have you heard? Well, I, I think one of the things that Stacy's always said is that you have to meet people where they are and to really find innovative ways to access that, that community that you want to reach out to. One of the things we're doing with the film actually is we've launched a, um, a bus tour and our bus is going all over the country to register people and to also conduct pop-up screenings. So all that goes to say um, that there, there's some magical thinking that's going to take place for you to figure out how to meet these students where they are. But I think this idea of the um, contest that you started is the beginning. And then I'm certain there will be a groundswell of other ideas. Free food is always good. And I also think that, um, you know, I, I, I mean, this sounds very self-promoting, but I think that this film and we'll, if you can get people there, it does inspire like a righteous outrage of like, don't take what's mine, <laughs> you know? And I think that if we can, you know, the, to the extent that you can engage folks emotionally in it, um, that can be helpful to making them care and make sure they hold what is theirs and not let anyone take it from them. Cause that's really what it is. Um, we also have a song from Janelle Monet. Um, in the end of the film and she's putting out a music video which was going to come out soon and you know we are and and so we are hopeful with like all the social media tools that will be developed from from that um, that hopefully it will be you know broadening the audience that generally comes to documentaries. Well I wish you the best of luck uh, and thanks, thanks Alex for, for taking this evening to, to share everything with us. Thank um, you. So uh, I look forward to someday having you on campus. Uh, <laughs> it's giving you pizza. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Food works for us too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Brenda. Big salad. I'm there for next year. All right. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Bring the bus to USC. Your your bus. They're they're, they're they're spending most of their time in the swing states, but um, you know we will. Uh, we will uh, can hope that they keep going. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Good night, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye.